but um, the jury's still out in regards to Matt, right? I mean, um, for those visiting, Matt's our new pastor and was it the 1st of Feb that you started, Matt? So (laughs) he's been here for maybe seven weeks, maybe seven weeks. And um, just between you and me, I think there's a screw too loose. So it was about four weeks ago, I was sitting over here before the service and Matt came over to me and he said, "Um, I want to see you, I want to see you after the service. I thought, okay. And I thought to myself, you know, your mind ticks over, I wonder what that's about. And um, he had caught up with Adam and had a drink and, you know, spent some time getting to know one another. And he had caught up with Josh <clears throat> and had a drink and spent some time getting to know one another. And he had said to me, Ladine, don't worry, I'm not leaving you out. We'll grab a coffee at some point and we'll have a chat and we'll get to know each other. So here I was thinking, you know, after the service, Matt's just going to organise a time during the week that we can get that coffee So it was a little bit surprising then after the service, I was out chatting outside and Matt came up to me and he said, now we need to um, to chat to you, let's just step into my office so we won't be distracted. Okay, so then, um, and then he begins the first ever real conversation that we've had, you know, we've passed some pleasant sort of comments to one another and then he starts by saying, Now, I'm going to ask you something, and I think that you will say no. Okay. And he said, when you say no, I'm going to tell you to go home and pray about it. (laughs) Okay. And then he said, would you preach one day? And I laughed and I said, Matt, I've been asked this before. You know, speaking from the pulpit is serious and it takes hours and hours and hours of prep. And he interrupted and he said, yeah, yeah, I I didn't say it was going to be easy and I didn't say it was going to be comfortable. He said, didn't you listen to my sermon last week on comfort? Well, all right, Matt. And then he said to me, Don't you think you are limiting what God could be doing through you to reach our community by putting all of those practicalities first? I mean, bam, Matt, start with the coffee first. (laughs) And so I stand here about to give my first ever sermon. Come on, it's good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I stand before you with a heart's desire to serve you, Lord, but admit that this looks differently to anything that I've ever imagined. My prayer this morning, Lord, is that people might not see the clumsiness of me, but that your words would inspire, your spirit would ignite, and that your presence might be felt here this morning. Through the study of your word, Lord, may we grow in our love and understanding of who you are. Might we grow in deepening the relationship that we have with one another. And might your spirit reach us, challenging us and shaping us to live out our calling in new ways. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to be really honest I'm not going to get you to talk about it, you don't have to share, but I want you to take a moment to reflect honestly with yourself. What's the point of church? Does church in 2021 have the same significance as the early church did in biblical times? Can I be a believer with a strong faith and not belong to church? If I'm totally honest, these are questions that I have asked in the last few years. And I want you to take a moment and I want you to reflect on what made you get up this morning and get dressed and prioritise coming here. Was it a sense of obligation? A habitual occurrence? You know, that's what good Christians do. 
Was it a sense of belonging, of wanting to connect with people that you know and love, with other believers? Was it a curiosity about the new pastor? Or an appreciation that our church has a kids program? Did you come along feeling lonely or broken? Are you seeking solace or acceptance? Do you have a yearning, a desire to know more about God's word? Or was it the opportunity to worship, to praise in music together? Probably a mixture of all of those things. Today, I want to, quest, I want to flesh out this question. What does it mean to be the church? As we focus on our next part in our series, we walk together. But before we get into that, I just want to recap what we've done so far in our series. So at first we learnt we walk with God, that he is the vine and we are the branches and we abide in him. Next we learnt that we walk with expectancy, using the story of Peter healing the crippled at the city gate who was begging, Matt inspired us to pray with expectancy, knowing that God can do mighty things through us. The following week, Matt inspired us to walk with encouragement, to get alongside one another and pull the courage out from one another. And we walk in prayer. Last week, Matt spoke about cultivating a habit of prayer so that we unleash the power of God. I love the analogy, we walk. It's active. It denotes movement, of journeying, of making progress. It doesn't matter if it's a power walk or a dawdle. There's movement. And today, I want to explore with you what it means to walk together, to grow together. Let's have a little look at Ephesians 4 more closely. As a prisoner of the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. That is why it says... When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Paul is a prisoner, 
probably in house arrest in Rome, and he's writing what was initially thought to be a circular letter to a group of ch uh, churches um, that was probably around the area of now Western Turkey. And it was thought that Ephesus was probably the biggest or the most important of those churches. And it differs from others of Paul's letters, which address particular key issues of a particular church. Ephesians is written more like a sermon, focusing on the character of Christ's church. And our reading of chapter 4 is the turning point of the book. Before chapter 4, we see Paul outlines praise for all that God has done through Christ. If you have your Bibles or your phones, you might want to have a little flick through chapters 1 to 3. In them, Paul outlines that as believers, we are chosen, adopted to sonship through Christ redeemed through his blood, that it's through his death and resurrection that the mystery of him is revealed to us. We have been gifted with the Holy Spirit and belong to God's family, made heirs with Christ, receiving every spiritual blessing. Paul has been specifically commissioned to work amongst the Gentiles. And in this letter, he stresses God's glorious plan to bring people of every nation and every background together in Christ. In chapter 4, we see him say, God has done all this stuff through Christ. And then he challenges the Gentiles, now consider, what is your response? As a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Paul is urging, exhorting, pleading that believers live the sort of life that matches their Christian beliefs. The word worthy excites that visual of a scale of what it's worth and suggests that there should be balance between our declarations and our actions. So Paul provides the criteria for which we can measure that balance in keeping our words and actions by stating that we should seek to do what is most in keeping with our calling. Our calling impacts our character. And this calling is received. It's not anything that is earned. It's not through self-effort, but a divine call to share in the company of those who are in Christ, that is, the church. It has Old Testament links, which sets out the story of God's people being set apart. I will be your God, and you will be my people. It demonstrates that our faith has a corporate element. Jesus came for the salvation of a people, he gathered a group of 12 in correspondence with the 12 tribes of Israel. In Galatians 6:16, 6, we read the New Testament church as referred to as the Israel of God. In 1 Peter 2:9, we read, "But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Scripture knows nothing of solitary conviction. No one can be reconciled to God without being reconciled to the people of God, among who they experience God's grace. The whole experience of salvation is tied inseparably with the church. The Bible closes with triumphant affirmation of this in Revelation 21.3. God's dwelling place is now among the people 
and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. God calls us to be his people. In verse 2 then, Paul goes on to describe four ways which we can show evidence of that balance between character and calling in showing humility, gentleness, patience and forbearance. Humility, a freedom from pride or arrogance, thinking of yourself more lowly than others. Humility changes our perspective from what's in it for me to what's in it for others. Gentleness, controlled strength, an absence of harshness or violence. Patience. It can often mean bearing pains or trials calmly and without complaint. But often in the New Testament, it seemed as a reluctance to revenge wrongs. Being patient finds its expression in bearing with one another, in holding each other up, in putting one another's faults and idiosyncrasies, I can't say that word, knowing that we all have our own. We put up with one another knowing that we're not perfect too. Forbearance, refraining from the enforcement of something such as a debt or a right or an obligation that is due. The absence of these qualities jeopardises our Christian unity. And that's why Paul then goes on to say, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is only one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul urges us to work hard at maintaining unity. The term make every effort acknowledges it's not going to be easy. Church is going to be messy. It's about different people coming together to be one in Christ. One body depicts the church as a visible community. Jews and Gentiles reconciled all as w members of the one same body. One spirit which indwells that body, the Holy Spirit, the pledge of our inheritance. One hope of sharing in Christ's glory, of knowing the full promise of what it means to dwell with God in heaven. One Lord, Jesus, who is central to all of our faith. One faith, a personal commitment to Christ, recognising him as our saviour. One baptism, the receiving of the Holy Spirit. One God and Father, who is over all and through all and in all. Have you ever heard the statement, that's not what Christians do? It's often spoken by someone trying to manipulate or coerce a particular response from you, trying to fit you snugly into the box that they have created for you. Or perhaps you've heard the comment, yeah, yeah, I used to go to church, but then that particular person did that particular thing, and well, church just isn't for me. I find these comments remarkable. I mean the very nature of church, our DNA, the overarching makeup of church is self-professed sinners crying out for their need of Jesus. Christians fall short all the time. We're sinful and clunky and selfish and vain. We just know it. I guarantee you, there will be people in church who think and behave differently than you do. Accept them anyway. I guarantee you, there will be people in church who are annoying. Love them anyway. 
I guarantee you there will be people in church who hurt you. Forgive them anyway. That is how we show the power of Christ's love through us. It demonstrates our faith and dependence on him, our desire and love to serve him, to let his spirit move and shape us, and it trumps our need to be right and to control others. Back in the day... Adam and I, together with others in our church, read a book by John Burke called No Perfect People Allowed. And it challenged church leaders to build authentic church communities that break down that concept that you have to be good before you can belong to God's family. That's not how walking together works. We all come broken we all have scars and hurts and insecurities and doubts and questions and regrets and parts of us we want to keep hidden. Walking together is being brave enough to be vulnerable with one another. Being humble enough to acknowledge we don't have all the answers. Being able to be transparent, to be truly known and loved anyway to bear with one another, to share one another's burdens, to hold each other up. You know, a few weeks ago, Matt played this little game with himself. He shared a hypothetical answer to a hypothetical question. He said if he could just choose two things for our church, he would choose that our church was filled with prayers and encouragers. People crying out to God, depending upon him for all things. And people who get next to one another and encourage each other. And it made me think, what do I want for our church? And my dream of church, and to be honest, the thing that keeps me coming back to that question, what's the point of church? is a deep desire of wanting to belong to God's family. I want our church to be made up of people who are committed to loving each other, who know each other deeply, who celebrate and mourn together, who steady one another and hold each other up. And we can only be that to one another if we're open to it. If we can love without judgment, if we can be challenged without becoming defensive. Your relationship with someone doesn't grow deeper unless you go through some stuff together. There's a Casting Crown song called Stained Glass Masquerade that talks about the plastic smiles on plastic people under plastic steeples with their walls up and their masks on. Have you heard it? I want us to be a church that takes the masks off. I want us to be a church that truly walks together, that are committed to growing together, who can demonstrate our love of Christ through our love of one another so much so that it shines through our community. And that's why I shared that story at the start, that don't you think you're limiting what God could be doing through you to reach our community comment? Because I could have reacted so very differently. I could have become angry and hurt and defensive. What do you know, Matt? You don't even know me. How do you know anything about my relationship with God? How do you know how God is using me to serve the community? But actually, I have a deep respect for people who can ask the hard-hitting questions. Because when you trust that they come from a place of love, it helps you to reflect and it makes you grow. We walk together. And I'm here today because Matt saw something in me that I didn't and he called me out on it. Let's look at what Ephesians goes on to say. 
What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Church is messy, but Jesus himself got amongst it. He didn't stay seated in the heavenly realms, but came to earth to reveal God's perfect will. He loved the unlovely. He ate with the tax collector. He held the leper. He stood up for the adulterer. He challenged the righteous. He showed us the way, the ultimate relationship with God the Father and with others too. And he equipped us to follow him. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Look at that. To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity. It's a process. It's a journey that we're walking on together. And if we're too fragile to bump into each other in here, how are we ever going to impact others being Jesus to them out there? We have to help each other grow and mature to his full purpose, to become like Jesus. You know, in our family we have a saying. You might not know this about Josh and Em, but they can occasionally become too (laughs) sloth-like. When they get consumed with studies or work or just their own little narrowness of themselves, um, I mean, um, even Josh's mates have made memes about it. (laughs) So when Adam and I feel like we're running around like crazy people, we'll call a family time out. We'll call a family meeting and we always ask the same question. We ask them, how are you contributing? We challenge them to consider what their input is in maintaining the welfare of all family members. Because they're young adults who can cognitively think outside of themselves and be considerate of others. And as parents, we don't want our grown children to still behave like infants. We don't want them crying and screaming and acting selfishly, impulsively to get what they want. Developing maturity is important. It involves growing and learning and making mistakes and being able to reflect and build independence so that they can reach the next generation and raise families of their own one day. No pressure. (laughs) What does church mean to you? Let's play a little game. Let's pretend Matt comes and asks you, if you could just choose two things for our church, what would you choose? And now let me ask you, how are you contributing to building that church? Look around you. Go on, don't be shy, look around you. We are called to be the church. We are God's family placed here for a time such as this. Are you willing to love like he does? Are you committed to walking together? Are you open to growing in maturity? Are you prepared to serve him? Let's be a people whose calling and character match. Let's take off the masks and be real with one another. Let's be vulnerable enough to be able to be challenged. 
Let's love like Jesus. Let's be his church. Amen.